Kia ora, welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. My name is Frances Cook. I'm the Investments Editor at Business Desk. We have a great Business Desk special for listeners and viewers, and you can find out about it at the end of this episode. But before we get started, some very important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Today, we're joined by Mark Lucas, who is CEO of Canisouth Bioscience Limited. Welcome, Mark. Good morning. Nice to talk to you again. Yeah, lovely to chat. I feel like it's no time at all since we last chatted. But as you were just saying before hitting record, you know, you've got so much going on in your company. So we will dive into all that exciting new stuff really soon. Before that, for anyone who missed the previous episode where we had a great chat, I mean, let's just do a really quick reintroduction of yourself and the company. You've been involved in this space in some sort of way since 1996, really, because you were the managing director of Hemp Tech New Zealand, textile company. Um, and then, you know, that was 1996 to 2018. And then little overlap, with the founding of Canna South in 2017, what is it that attracts you to this area and makes you find it interesting? Uh, well, I think originally it was um, we were involved in hemp, and that's a lovely, got a lovely natural story, um, natural fiber, the hemp seed oil, health um, and wellness. And it's interesting to see the hemp uh, sector now sort of slowly after all these years really starting to get going. You can sort of see a lot more uh, hemp food products coming on the market as sort of health conscious markets and wellness continues to develop. So it's sort of just been a bit of a segue really from that sector. And, and we saw this sector emerging, the medicinal side of things, and, and that was quite exciting. And anything that involves health and wellness um, is exciting. And I think it's more and more people are conscious of these things. So yeah, it was just a natural progression, really. I was going to say, I feel like the theme to me um, comes across as that sort of the natural approach to health and wellness. Would you say that that is an overall guiding principle for you? I think it's definitely in there for sure. Uh, you know, I, I try and look after my own health and wellness and I'm conscious of, you know, what I eat and, um, and also medicines and, you know, what I take and why I take it and why I don't take certain things. And I think, you know, there are a lot of people that are looking for more natural alternatives to, you know, um, especially in the medicinal space, you know, to some of the, um, you know, the, the pharmaceuticals that are on the market these days that often come with some, you know, hefty side effects. I mean, pharmaceuticals and medicines are incredible. We can't live without them. But, you know, I think there's definitely a, a sector out there of people that are looking for a, sort of a more natural alternative. And of course, you know, as we've talked about a little bit, but let's dive into you're a medicinal cannabis company. So it's somewhat of a surprisingly crowded space really so you've differentiated yourself by really specializing talk me through what sort of products you have and how they're different from other products and, and what other companies offer yeah so we can't talk this is the difficulty in this industry we can't really promote well we can't promote products at all so i can talk in very general terms i mean when we set Canna south up we obviously have big ambitions we want to be a global player so we had to really understand where the medicinal market was going and start to try and build uh, facilities and and develop products that you know we thought that's where patients and the markets are going so part of that was building facilities that are capable of producing uh, flour as the finished product there is you know, very large market for people that still use cannabis flour as a vaporized product or as a tea um, as the finished product. And so that's quite specialized um, facilities that are required to actually produce that type of flour. And so we've invested um, in that significantly. And we're just working through the commercialization of that facility now and certification to those pharmaceutical standards. Um, but beyond that, we are, we are definitely interested in um, the further potential of the pharmaceutical development of medicinal cannabis products, they've got a long way to go. The products at the moment are still very, if you exclude the dried flour, you're still moving into uh, oils and tinctures, which are 
pretty primitive formulations really so we're quite excited and, and very interested in developing sort of the next generation products that are a bit more bioavailable um, that potentially have different formulations of different active ingredients that are uh, you know targeted to actually um, work uh, more effectively for different conditions um, and then also developing clinical data that supports those products because, you know, a lot of prescribers, of course, are hesitant around medicinal cannabis because they don't feel there is enough clinical data to support the products. There is a lot of clinical data out there, but um, the more that you can produce, you know, the better. It must be tricky sometimes because I feel like people come to this conversation often with a lot of preconceived notions. One way or the other, there are people who are huge fans and think that this is the future and it you know cannabis products can cure everything there are people who come at it from the other side thinking of it as you know the recreational use that people just want to get high you know when you're trying to talk to people about the medicinal uses for this how much of a tightrope are you walking between all of these various preconceived notions that people bring to this conversation? I, th I think you've summed it up quite nicely. For us, it's about um, just telling the, 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 the story as it is. That you know, The truth is usually in the middle, and it, and, it, and it very much is in this instance. Cannabis and medicinal cannabis is not the cure for everything. Um, but uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, it has some very, very... Um, um, it has a lot of potential for a, a broad range of conditions. We're seeing that the anecdotal evidence, the number of people that use these products um, and have had to access them often from the black market because they've just had no alternative, um, risking, um, you know, um, uh, criminal conviction, you know, shows that uh, there is efficacy in these products. But because, you know, the, the formulations that people have been using from the black market are very simple formulations, but often effective, you know, and many of these products haven't gone through that full clinical pathway with clinical trials. There is this perception that there is no data to support these, but there, you know, there, there's plenty out there. You've only got to hear the patient stories that, that we get all the time from patients that are actually using them to, to understand how um, they change people's lives, but they're certainly not the cure for everything. And so, you know, we, we think the truth is in the middle. And for us, it's just about telling that story. Do you ever, because like you said before, you are quite restricted in how you can promote your products. I mean, you, you can't really promote your products. Um, and you're quite restricted in terms of how you can talk about it. So does it end up being that people come to you and then you can supply them with information? Do you ever do outreach to prescribers, to the, the other people in the medical field to give them that sort of information? How do you do it? So uh, the, the Medicinal Cannabis Agency lists uh, on their website um, all of the products that have been verified as meeting the New Zealand minimum quality standard. So prescribers through that process can actually see what products are available and they can also see what companies um, distribute them. And so prescribers can reach out to us seeking information in, in that instance that we can then talk to them about the products. Um, generally, you know, because these products are not um, approved to treat any specific conditions, most of the information that we give them is about dosing, you know, how to dose these products. Um, and then prescribers need to educate themselves really um, about what conditions they may or may not be, you know, able to be used for. Um, often patients are already coming with, um, you know, what products they would like to try because they're already accessing products from the black market of certain types, either THC or CBD or what have you. And now there is a legal pathway they simply want to transition across. But if you talk to some of the specialist clinics and that they play a key part in this because they have prescribers that are actually... Um, educated about the products and, and potential uses of those. You know, those clinics will often tell you that the mix of um, existing patients that are just looking to transition from, you know, illicit supply to uh, a legal prescription market, it's, you know, you're, you're getting sort of almost a 50-50 mix of, of new patients that have actually never tried these before and that are looking for an alternative to a sort of chronic ongoing condition. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of interest, but yes, certainly um, the education piece is a key bit with prescribers. But yeah, we are very limited. We have to wait for them to come and talk to us, really.
on that note, you know, let's talk about, we'll have a lot of investors listening to this who will be interested in the numbers. So let's dive into that. I mean, it's been over three years since you were the first medicinal cannabis company to list on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. So you, you dove into that. You were a leader there. You have posted losses since then, including the most recent uh, 8.2 million annual loss for the year to December 2022. When do you think or when do you hope the business will turn the corner to profitability? Yeah, well, I think um, firstly, if we sort of break down that journey, so when Canisouth listed, the medicinal cannabis scheme itself was not even um, in effect. They didn't even come into effect until the 1st of April 2020. So literally, we were starting from um, a very, I mean, we're talking about a startup phase. So building a business from scratch, that's that's. Um, designing facilities, that's building facilities, that's developing the the team and and, and um, getting the people that we need, um, that's developing the quality management systems, that's developing the products themselves, and then you know certification. So the the journey to build one of these businesses is uh, complex. It's expensive and it takes it takes a while. Um, so I think what there was some initial um, excitement, should we say, a, around the sector, and we, we see this in, in Sunrise Industries. We saw this in the tech industry as well, where there's an initial, you know, over excitement, and then you you move to the next phase, which is actually, you know, the sector itself doesn't go away, but you almost come to a new group of um, investors at that stage that have sort of sat back and they realise, yes, this is a real industry. But then they start to look around for you know, who's got the, the right strategy to actually compete and grow in that sector. And this process takes time. And so the losses posted and the investment that we've made, are, it's basically, it is the cost of entry to enter the sector. There are, there's no shortcuts. Um, so in terms of moving to profitability, we, we move through from establishment phase, which is build everything I just described. Then we move into commercialization phase, which that itself takes time, getting products through regulatory you know, hoops to get into export markets, onto local markets, those markets are growing. Then you know, the next phase after that will be profitability. So we're in the commercialization phase. How do we get meaningful revenues beginning to flow? And then obviously the next step in that journey would be moving towards profitability. But, you know, we, we've got, as I mentioned before, global and, and uh, aspirations. And so, you know, we're continually looking at how we can build this business to, to be competitive on the global market. But, you know, all the while, we definitely want to make sure that we, um, we look after New Zealand patients as well. And we like to think that we've demonstrated that by, you know, you know verifying products here for New Zealand patients as well. Yeah, I've seen some comments from you that you want 2023 to be the year you start generating, quote, meaningful revenue. Um, and that's partly thanks to some new products you've got in market. So tell me more about that. What is meaningful revenue? I mean, obviously, we've, uh, and again, without promoting products in any way, but we've, you know, we've had products verified in the New Zealand market. And those, um, the New Zealand market is still small. It's going to grow fast. We've seen what happened in Australia and what is happening in Australia. And so, uh, the New Zealand market itself is not enough to sustain a business like Canna South with, um, you know, global aspirations. So the export market is the key to actually, um, you know, developing the types of revenues that we need to be able to scale the business to, you know, provide um, more cost effective products for New Zealand patients, but also compete globally. So that's the process that we're going through now. So, you know, there are some regulatory um, barriers to export that um, we, have to, we have to jump through. Um, we're working through that. And then certification of the facilities, um, you know, the more, uh, you know, we've got GACP certification, which is a sort of an agricultural um, quality standard for the biomass that we produce. But the key for us is getting to GMP certification for the flour as the finished product. That's the that's the next step for us, and that helps unlock you know more meaningful revenues in those export markets, and also um, gets us to the point where we can actually um, begin the verification process for putting flour as a finished product um, on the New Zealand market. And of course, meaningful revenue, an excellent uh, goal. I think everyone can agree, but it is different from being profitable, of course, because then if we're looking at profits, we'd have to take all the costs into account. So are those two goals separate timelines for your business? And do you have an idea of how those timelines look? Yeah, that's right. Getting getting through those, through those regulatory barriers, getting products into market, getting the revenues flowing with these types of products, 
Um, Often your customers are wanting to place some of that product, especially in the flower space, in market, and then they build demand from there. And so, you know, we've got a push model at the moment, which is where we produce material and we push it out into that market. And we're, we're transitioning to a pull model where customers are pulling, um, you know, based on the demand that they're seeing in those markets. So that's going to take a little while to work our way through. Um, and then again, Profitability, also probably, you know, um, significant profitability probably requires some more scaling up of certain operations that we're conducting as well. So, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer to get to that profitable stage. I'm always hesitant to sort of, you know, say exactly when we expect something like that to happen. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of barriers that we're still jumping through. But the first step is just getting those meaningful revenues flowing in. And then we can weigh up the various options that we've got for particular markets or scaling this facility or this product um, as the case may be and we've got technologies that we've been developing as well drug delivery technologies which you know aim to solve problems that are um, global problems and so we're looking for licensing um, opportunities for those products so we've got quite a few um, you know quite a few revenue um, options available to us but we just need to now get them into market and you know sort of build them up from there. And you mentioned before about the export regulations, which I imagine is quite tricky, um, especially given, as you say, you have worldwide aspirations. So that's something that's going to need sorting. Um, is it something that once you get through the certification and once it is, you know, signed, ink dried, then that's done? Or is it an ongoing issue there? Uh, it's a, it's an ongoing issue. So you've got two, you know, you've we've got first you've got to get the product out of the country. So you've got to meet New Zealand standards. Then you've got to get it into the target market. So each market you go into in this space is, you know, um, similar, but often you know there's there's nuances in the regulatory and quality uh, requirements which require you to sort of navigate. That requires a you know really experienced team to do that. Um, and often the barriers that we're confronting are, but we're confronting them, you know, from an export perspective as a New Zealand company, often for the first time, or there's only been another one other company that's actually got to that. So um, working through those, then developing the sort of the muscle memory within the system to streamline that process moving forward is, is the key. Um, that, that takes a little while. The, the regulations themselves for export, we're fortunate here in New Zealand, you know, there's the regulations here cop a lot of crit criticism. Um, the agency, I think, has copped a lot of criticism. But I think the intent of the agency is to support industry. I think the intent of the regulations has always been good. Um, there are nuances there that, that do require some adjustment. And the agency have been engaging with industry to identify those and to come up with potential solutions and so um, recently they put to get to the industry a series of questions around some of these export challenges that we've got um, to get industry's feedback. They are going to put some recommendations to, um, to the government basically for um, adjustments to the regulations. What we need the government to do is to really focus on some of those recommendations and to fast track that process because some of these barriers just they add time and time um, is reduced shelf life of products uh, time is money in the space and so we can get through these barriers on the way through but um, there it is some of these barriers are holding the industry back and if we really want to be a, a global player and i'm talking about the industry not just canisel you know we need to make sure that we're reducing or removing sort of unnecessary uh, barriers that aren't adding any real value. What sort of changes could we see there if those changes do go ahead? Well, I mean, one classic one in, in particular that, that is a real challenge is at the moment, you know, we have a New Zealand minimum quality standard here in New Zealand that all products that, you know, are on the market need to meet. We're also at this point in time requiring all export product to meet the New Zealand minimum quality standard. Um, then it needs, um, uh, then those products need to then meet the, the quality standard and the regulatory um, uh, levels that are required in particular export markets. So you've got to jump through two sets of hoops. And now just the assessment process to actually have your product assessed by the agency takes time. You know, when we've got a um, dried flower, for example, that has a, it's a perishable product. Um, every month that you lose or, or two months, um, you know, is 
is time that you're losing on the um, stability or shelf life of that product. And plus, it's just another month or two more of inventory that you've got to have in hand all the time. So that's just one example. You know, one of the other areas that we would like to see would be the rescheduling of CBD products, the non-psychoactive CBD products. Um, in Australia, they've rescheduled those so that they um, will and can be over the counter um, from a pharmacy. Um, there, there's still challenges with that. They, you, uh, producers need to produce um, some efficacy data around those products for very low dose. C these are low dose CBD products. Um, we'd like to see a similar approach here in New Zealand that would increase accessibility for patients that are just looking for CBD products. So there's a, a range of other um, areas that that need to be sort of um, you know, adjusted within the regulations, within our annual report that we uh, released recently, we sort of highlight some of those topics in there. So for the train spotters that are really interested, I'd encourage, I'd encourage them just to go and have a read of that as well. And of course, an election year this year. So if there was a change in government, do you think that would impact your industry at all? Uh, I think if you look at the medicinal cannabis in general, the uh, favourability or, you know, uh, public support for medicinal cannabis is very high. I mean, I think surveys I've seen are 90%. The fact we have a medicinal cannabis scheme is because of public pressure. You know, the public pressured politicians to actually act and create the scheme. I think what we've seen from um, uh, all the major political parties is a belief that medicinal cannabis um, is a good thing. And I think most of what we've seen from uh, various politicians is, is, if anything, they want to fast track the streamlining of some of these challenges that I've highlighted. So, you know, we we don't particularly think that a change of government would, would be bad for medicinal cannabis. Um, but, you know, equally, the current government are responsible for actually getting the scheme up and running as well. So I think there's, there's broad public support and political support for medicinal cannabis. Now, I want to move to some of the things that you've been doing in your business because you're you're incredibly busy. The last time I spoke to you, not very long ago, you'd just within hours um, before our chat, hours before that, you'd signed a big, well, at least, you'd put out the word that you'd signed out a big supplier agreement with Wico Pharmacy based in Germany. Sorry, Wico Pharma. And now you have a merger and a capital raise underway. That's right. Uh, and to give listeners a brief overview, uh, you would buy Equalis in an all-share deal. Then you plan to raise between seven and eleven million by selling new shares, twenty-nine cents a piece. Shareholders meeting going ahead soon. I believe that's next week to see whether this plan will be approved. So, first of all, uh, as the man in charge of all of that, is that an accurate summary? And can you give us some more depth? Yeah, I think. You know, things move so quickly in this industry and the industry globally is moving so quickly as well. We can't afford to sort of sit back and be reactive. We've got to try and be at the forefront and and be, you know, leading the charge. And that's what we're doing. So the proposed merger with Aqualis is, is definitely designed to make sure that we have a business that can compete in the global market. Uh, with the capabilities that are required. And so we're very, very excited about that um, process. But yeah, look, it's just a whirlwind in this space. There's just so much happening. But you know, we're up for the challenge. We're excited by it. But, you know, and, and, you know, we're looking forward to moving through that next phase of that process. So it's, but it's been a whirlwind, that's for sure. Yeah, I'll bet. So when you're looking at Aqualis and, uh, you know, if there's a merger, I imagine the idea is to combine your strengths. So what um, does each company bring to the table that you are hoping to combine to make you stronger overall? Yeah, it's quite remarkable, really, actually. Uh, if you look at two complementary businesses, you know, you, you'd be hard pressed to find two businesses that were more complementary than this, really. You know, we, both businesses have set off on a journey um, to build a position in this emerging sector. Um, and they've gone about it in slightly different ways with, you know, some small areas of overlap, um, complementary overlap on the way through. So for uh, Aqualis, for example, they're very... Um, skilled and knowledgeable in the process uh, development, process engineering. Their managing director has got a long history of disrupting industries with um, innovative uh, process developments for actually producing ingredients. 
And, you know, a lot of this business is about producing ingredients at the lower cost. And I think everybody recognises that um, we would like to bring the cost down for patients. These aren't subsidised medicines. So to do that, you've really got to look at how can we improve and reduce the cost of manufacture. So they're very, very good in that space of producing um, ingredients. Uh, they've got their GMP certification for manufacture of finished products, sort of oral doses, um, oil-based sort of tinctures. Um, we've developed the flour, producing the flour as the finished product, which is, is a, you know, one of the fastest growing areas within medicinal cannabis um, at the moment globally. So uh, if you combine our flour production, they've got uh, finished product manufacture. They've also got, so we've got indoor cultivation of the, very mo of the most premium flour. They've also worked a lot in uh, outdoor cultivation for producing the flour that can be extracted and turned into those um, tinctures, those oil-based products. So you sort of create a bit of an end to end there. The other area that, that we are strong is in the pharmaceutical development area that I touched on earlier. Some of the technologies that we've been working on for improving the actual product itself, the sort of Gen 2 products. So we, to really unlock that potential um, outside of just doing licensing deals, et cetera, having that GMP manufacturer of finished products capability enables us to really, um, you know, get that, get that product moving. And the other area um, that Aqualis is invested in is the sort of specialist clinic model as well. And that's been, had a real focus on reducing the cost to patient of actually um, seeing a physician, a physician that is suitably educated in these products um, to enable, you know, because a lot of patients are coming across talking to doctors that just know nothing about these products. They just don't know where to start. So, so but if you put those, those things together, you've sort of got an end to end. You've got premium flour, indoor or, you know, controlled environment um, greenhouse that we've got. You've got outdoor cultivation. You've got manufacturing of finished products. You've got pharmaceutical development. You've got process engineering. Um, so we're looking at improving the products um, in terms of efficacy. They're looking at reducing the cost, which is, you know, you combine those two things together and that's quite powerful. So, yeah, it's really quite uncanny how complementary they are. Um, also at a values level, uh, both companies are highly innovative. You know, we've got innovation at our core and, um, so the cultures line up as well. So it's not like you're trying to jam two businesses together and you've got, you know, um, cultures that don't work. Our teams have actually, through this process, been very excited to be working together. And so we're all just excited to get through to the next phase and, and really, you know, start delivering for shareholders and patients. So it's exciting times. And of course, all subject to shareholder approval for this plan. So have you had any early feedback from shareholders, how they might be feeling about this idea? Yeah, look, early feedback is, is very positive. We've tried to put as much information as we can, explaining everything that I just talked about to shareholders to give them a view. We also um, commissioned an independent report, which was a requirement um, to, to you know, give shareholders a view of the values of this. Um, and so, yeah, so far, um, the interactions that I ha have had has been, have been very positive, very supportive of what we're trying to do. So, so that's great. Mm. Now, in terms of if this goes ahead, then you're looking to do the capital raise. One thing that strikes me is, of course, inflation very high, cost of living on everyone's mind. Do you think it's a tough time for a capital raise? Oh, look, it's an incredibly tough time for a capital raise. You know, let, let's face it, um, you know, global uncertainty is, is at an, an all-time high, well, not an all-time high, but it's, it's very high at this point in time. You know, but having said that, uh, canny investors often look at these points in time and markets as a time to actually invest because, you know, markets have come off the highs that they were, um, that were at not that long ago. And so there are some good opportunities. Um, I think one of the benefits that we see for this proposed merger is also a mixing of shareholder bases as well. So Canna South has been incredibly um, fortunate to be backed by a huge number of retail um, shareholders, you know, including, you know, significant amount through sharesies. And, and um, a lot of those from data that we've seen have been shareholders that have continued to back us. They seem to be holding their shares and, and sticking with us for the journey, and that's really important. Um, Aqualis have a different mix of shareholders. They have um, a smaller group of um, sort of high net worth 
um, type investors. And, you know, we're trying to build an investor base here that is, is with us for the journey. You know, this is not the um, gold rush mentality. We're really trying to paint realistic expectations. We're building, we're trying to build a sustainable position in a huge global emerging market that takes time. So, you know, we try and be very careful about what we put into the market so that we're not setting unrealistic expectations. Is the market tough? Absolutely. But, you know, we've also been um, fortunate to um, bring on firm commitments already for this capital raise before we've even launched the capital raise of um, 3.3 million, I think, so far. So and we continue to hopefully build that book on the way through. So that, that shows that there are people that are out there that are prepared to, you know, continue to invest in the sector and, and um, this new merge co. One thing that um, strikes me when we've been talking so far is, you know, there's there's a lot of regulatory challenges. There's also the various markets. There's how um, customers are feeling about it. There's how investors are feeling about it. There's, there's so many factors in the mix. Of course, as there is for every company, but particularly yours is one that is, it's a, it's a new industry and it's an industry that is making waves and, and trying to change things. I and mean, what do you think when you look at yourselves operating out of New Zealand versus when you compare other companies around the world? What is that New Zealand versus international scene like? So, I mean, the cannabis liberalisation globally is picking up speed. Markets are changing all the time. You know, many markets that start to allow um, cannabis um, begin by allowing medicinal cannabis because there's so much patient demand for these products. And so often what they do is they apply a pharmaceutical type quality standard, which is what we've built our facilities to do. And so um, sometimes they start to move towards an adult use market. Sometimes they don't. Um, but I think the overall trend is is to uh, you know continue to allow more access to medicinal cannabis in general. And so, um, you know, the regulatory environments around the world where you do, as I say, have these sort of pharmaceutical quality standards to protect patients um, are these nuances, but they are very similar as well. And if we go globally and go to various trade shows that we do, you'll start to see that, you know, yes, some countries have been at it for a lot longer, but not necessarily with this full GMP overlay. And so, we're actually not that far behind. And if you look at the products that are on the market, still often quite simple formulations. We haven't seen anything, you know, um, there's gaps there. There's lots of opportunities for IP development and actually licensing um, products and, and innovation. And so um, Canna South and Merge Co is about innovation. The only way that New Zealand that can compete in global markets, and it's the same for all products generally is um, innovation and quality. You know, we're so far away from key markets. How do we do things better? And how do we trade on New Zealand's reputation for having the very highest quality? So that we're seeing, you know, those are key things for us um, in, in global markets. Um, global customers are very interested in talking to us because of New Zealand's reputation and um, you know, that's important. When we need more than just Canna South or Merge Co to be, you know, um, successful in New Zealand in the medicinal cannabis space because what we really need is, um, a, you know, a, a group of companies that can go into the global market where there's plenty of room for everybody that can take New Zealand's brand to the world because that's how we get um, these some of these customers coming to us, you know, identifying New Zealand as a great place, reliable place to source products. And so, yeah, the global market's developing fast, but, you know, we, we think we're well positioned. We've taken a lot of the learnings that, you know, we've seen from other markets that got ahead of themselves. Canada is, an, you know, is a classic example. Uh, the US is still all over the place as well. And, you know, we can apply some of those things to what we're doing. So it's exciting times. I was just going to say, I mean, I think if you're looking at overseas examples, the US is a really obvious one mm. in terms of they've tried several different ways of handling this. I mean, what do you see there? Do you see examples of what to do, what not to do? Well, the US is interesting because cannabis is still federally illegal. So essentially what you've got is each state grappling with these challenges in a different way. So if you if you look around the states, you'll see every example, you know, of of how to roll these schemes out. Um, 
you know, we look at Europe, it's and Germany's leading the charge over there. Again, they're more looking at this in a um, in a let's allow medicinal cannabis, let's make sure we retain the quality, let's, you know, apply a pharmaceutical quality standard. You know, these standards are designed to protect the whole reason that GMP, for example, exists is, you know, it came into place when, you know, snake oil was being produced and sold as medicines. And so there needed to be a framework that um, that actually protected patients and consumers from what was being sold and, and the quality standards. So, you know, the US is all over the place. I think if you if you travel around, you'll see different states that, you know, you could argue are doing it better than others. Um, but it is because of that federal, you know, Ill illegality, it, it is a very messy market, whereas um, Europe is a lot clearer for us. Australia is a very, very good example. The Australian market is just continually, continuing to grow exponentially. It's, uh, it's very similar to New Zealand. Uh, the quality standards are around uh, pharmaceutical quality, you know, products. Um, they have a prescription model like New Zealand, so you, you need to see a physician, you get a prescription. One of the interesting things about Australia is that they are actually firming up their quality standards. They are um, moving to better enforce GMP quality standards for products because there has been a range of approaches to what quality actually means in that market. So as of the 1st of July, they are enforcing true GMP quality standards in Australia. And that's a significant change over there. That's more in line with what we have here in New Zealand. So that means that Australia really becomes, you know, more of a key market for us as well. So, yeah, it's very interesting. But, you know, it requires staying on top of these markets. You need to have highly skilled regulatory people that can sort of understand the, the direction of travel, or, you know, and market intelligence function to see where these markets are going. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of where things are going, next 12 months, if you get out the crystal ball, what are you expecting for your company over the next year or so, uh, particularly if you have a highlight and maybe a low light? Well, I guess we... Um, you know, the the merger is a is a big one, right? So um, you know we're we're certainly working as hard as we can to make sure that merger comes off. That will fundamentally change this business. It will no longer be Canis South. It'll be Merge Co. You know it, it will be Canis South in, in um, technicality because of course Canis South is the listed entity. And um, but we will really be building a um, and we're, you know part of what we look we're proposing to do is a rebrand um, over time. Don't want to lose focus on that. We've got to make sure we 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 get that, those revenues in the door. So getting that merger away is a key for us. Um, getting through to GMP certification, um, you know, starting to get some of our uh, technology that we've been working on um, licensed as a, as a key as well, and really opening up those export markets. And that's the same for both companies. So that's you know the key things for us. Um, I guess you know potential lowlights. Um, well, let's, you know, let's hope that the regulatory review process doesn't get delayed um, any further. I think it's important. We really need everyone that's interested in this sector to, um, you know, apply a bit of pressure to their um, local politicians, especially, um, you know, the government at the moment. Uh, they've got a lot that they're trying to focus on. But, but really, you know, we've got this industry here. There is a big potential for New Zealand, but it requires strong leadership from the government. They need to listen to the agency who have been listening to industry and really focus on getting some of that regulatory change made so that we can go on and compete in the global market. All right. It's interesting stuff. I can't wait to see what happens for you guys over the next year or so. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in. And of course, a big thank you to Mark for joining us. Really appreciate your time and your insights. My pleasure. I always enjoy these conversation so i look forward to um yeah our next exciting developments i was gonna say when you next announce something huge and we have to bring you back now we do have a special offer for sharesies investors from business desk if you use the promo code shared lunch 2023 you'll get a hundred dollars off an annual subscription to business desk which is usually 249 dollars, including gst so not bad the offer does only apply to new business desk subscribers can only be used once per subscriber can't be used with any other discounts enjoy the rest of your week stay safe Oh, my God.